Hi, everybody. <clears throat> welcome back. Um, welcome back to many of you who have been following us along anyways, and perhaps welcome for the first time if we have any newcomers to our winter webinar series and, and the CRED Talks. Uh, my name is Haley Ross, for those of you who don't know me, and I work for the Columbia Mountains Institute, or CMI for short, and I'm joined here today um, with Kendall Benish from the Kootenai Conservation Program, or KCP for short. And um, KCP and CMI, as I think you know, have joined forces, joined the Winter Webinar Series, KCP's Winter Webinar Series, and CMI's CRED Talks of the Columbia Region Ecological Discussions um, for what has been a really fantastic webinar series thus far. Um, and thanks for joining us. So what have we been doing? Um, this season of webinars is following a theme, and the theme that we've chosen is Foundations for Resilience, understanding departures from historical ecosystems and adapting for resilient futures. And we've been welcoming seven speakers who were drawing on patterns from the past, challenges in the present and scenarios for the future um, to explore adapting ecosystems for resilience in the Columbia Basin region. Um, this year's CRED Talks and KCP Winter Webinar Series is financially supported by the Columbia Basin Trust. Many thanks to the trust for that support and, and helping us ensure that this really great program continues on. Today, we have a very special guest um, who will be speaking from experience about the history and value and current practice of cultural burning. This is Joe, Gil Joe Gilchrist, and I'll be introducing Joe in more detail in just a moment. But before I do that, um, I'd like to just pause, <clears throat> as we have been doing collectively at the beginning of all of these, to acknowledge the land that I broadcast from. So for myself personally, um, I'm in Revelstoke, BC, and this is the unceded homeland of the Sinaiax people. The Shaquapum people have also stewarded this land for millennia. And the Tanaha call this valley the land of the Chickadee in their creation story. And the Seok of the Okanagan Nation Alliance also express strong connections with this place. Now, as um, we've been doing, I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. And please also share your own land acknowledgement um, if you're able. So this is a great opportunity to test out the chat for folks who are perhaps new to Zoom. Um, chances are that you'll be using it soon um, to ask some questions. We'll be using the chat for the Q&A. So feel free to enter yeah, your name, perhaps who you're working with, um, and the, the area that you're Zooming in from today. Thanks. So while those are coming in, I'm just going to keep trucking along to keep us on time and let you know a little bit about one of your host organizations today. Oh, we're in the wrong order. Sorry. There we go. I'm ahead of myself. Um, so I'm with CMI, as I said, and I wanted to let you know that uh, who CMI is for those of you who are new. So uh, we're a nonprofit organization and an association for primarily for applied ecologists. And what we do is we provide professional development opportunities, essentially, and those come in many forms. So they come in the form of webinars, of course, um, conferences, courses, and they deal with everything from research techniques to more complex land management conundrums. And um, we deliver those services primarily to folks in southeastern BC and the Columbia Mountains region. Um, but our membership extends beyond that, and we're getting more and more membership from areas like Alberta, um, the Yukon, and the Northwest Territories. Um, I'd love to tell you more about CMI, of course, but I won't babble on too long. The best spot to learn more about us is on our webpage. Um, so that's www.cmiae.org. And you can learn all sorts of um, interesting information there. And there are a number of uh, resources that I would draw your attention to. And those include, of course, the recordings from talks like this um, and also preceding documents from all of our major conference events. So at this stage, I'm going to pass it over to Kendall. Thank you, Haley. My name is Kendall Benish, and I'm joining you on behalf of Kootenai Conservation Program, or KCP. KCP's work occurs in the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Tanaha, Shikwetmik, Sinaiks, and Silks Okanagan peoples who've lived here and cared for the land, water, and wildlife since time immemorial. 
KCP is a broad partnership of 85 land and water conservation and stewardship groups, indigenous nations, government agencies, resource industries, and agricultural producers working throughout the East and West Kootenays. Our mandate is to coordinate and facilitate conservation efforts on private land and to generate the support and resources needed to maintain this effort, which includes building technical knowledge in webinars like this. We're very excited to be hosting this webinar series with CMI and to welcome Joe today. And we'd like to give an additional thanks to our program sponsors, without whom we'd not be able to support this type of work. So just a couple of housekeeping details from me and then we'll get started. As you've noticed, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted to the event web pages within a week and you're welcome to share it widely. We ask that you remain muted unless you're asking a question during the Q&A at the end of the talk. And we will be using the chat function for the Q&A. So throughout the webinar, you're welcome to add your questions into the chat at any time, um, but we won't be addressing those until later on. Over to you, Haley. Thanks, Kenna. Okay, great. So um, let's welcome Joe Gilchrist. We're really fortunate to have him with us today. Um, and he'll be presenting, uh, sharing some information on cultural burning. So before I pass it over to Joe, I'm just gonna read a short bio here. So Joe was born in Kelowna, BC from Fichestin. How'd I do, Joe? <laughs> Good. Um, he lived in Ashcroft, Merritt and Kamloops and began his forest fire career at the age of 15 in Merritt, BC. In 1991, he served as squad boss and soon thereafter as unit crew leader on the newly formed Type 1 unit crew Merit, the Fire Devils. That was a 100% Indigenous unit crew. Later, Joe became a full-time employee with the BC Wildfire, and he began his work with the nonprofit society Interior Salish Fire Keepers to help revive Indigenous knowledge and cultural burning on the landscape. So, Joe, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. I'll pass it over to you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to be here and uh, be nice to do this in person. But uh, yeah, this is this is a great way to get a message out and um, for for an in Indigenous people to uh, to say that uh, we need to bring cultural burning back uh, and in order to do that, you know, a lot of laws need to be changed and. Uh, uh, like the Wildfire Act and, you know, just being able to burn off of the Indian Reserve. Uh, right now, I can I can burn on the Indian Reserve. Uh, some Indian Reserves, you're, you're actually not allowed to burn. Uh, so um, uh, the big changes that happened came uh, with colonialism, uh, you know, about it. Uh, about a hundred years ago or so, uh, not being allowed to burn, uh, all the practices that happened uh, in the past kind of came to a halt. Not only with that, with the laws like that, the uh, residential schools and the uh, smallpox epidemic, especially, uh, was a huge loss of uh, between fifty and ninety percent of a lot of the indigenous villages at the time and in some cases some indigenous villages were wiped right out by the smallpox epidemic and uh, and so along with that was the loss of uh, knowledge and and that uh, connection to the land and then soon after that the uh, residential school happened and kind of split families up and uh, lost uh, more uh, knowledge and so what we have now is the uh, piecing together and stories uh, from different families and uh, some families specialize in some medicine and some are, are pretty good at mostly all of it. So then we're, we're just uh, seeing how fire was used and uh, trying to bring that knowledge back. Um, that's what the the newly formed interior, interior Salish fire keepers are doing now. Uh, just trying to 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 get all those stories from uh, matriarchs, from very 
pickers and gatherers and hunters uh, on where and when things were burned and why and, and how they're burned and uh, what time of year, all that kind of knowledge that that we need to bring back and begin to apply to the land. And of course, the reason uh, for for applying fire to the land right now is uh, what we have right now is uh, that the land is uh, sick, we say. Um, the forests are overgrown. Uh, uh, there's a lot of encroachment happening where um, uh, the knowledge, the stories say that uh, a land was mostly grassland before and now it's either covered in sage in brush or it's taken over by uh, by a forest and and, uh, and that's that's because the uh, cultural burning was taken away and uh, in some cases now um, the forests that have taken over uh, they should have been burned every seven to 15 years that I am talking about uh, ponderosa pine interior Douglas fir uh, it, if you wanted to change from grassland to forest, still that forest with um, the, the burn cycle for grass is every two years. The burn cycle for ponderosa pine interior Douglas fir is seven to 15 years. So um, if we say that we've missed um, 10, 10 uh, or 100 years of burning, then uh, that's about, we'll, we'll say, either seven to 10 burn cycles. And um, uh, uh, mature ponderosa pine drops one ton of needles every year. And uh, uh, that's, that goes on the ground without burning, it just piles up and piles up and actually suppresses um, bunch grass and, and uh, other medicines that that would have been there uh, prior to the encroachment. Um, so all that fuel and all the branches breaking, and then the disease that's happening with um, and and uh, uh, different uh, bugs that are out of control. All of that is adding to um, the fuel, and all, and then if you had ponderosa pine, you could have Douglas fir moving in too. So now you're getting uh too much uh too much trees that are fighting for the the nutrients and the water availability and so you're seeing um ponds drying up and uh that used to have water in them and uh and every once in a while I'll look at my notes here um so in the um in the past, the history of, of cultural burning and indigenous fire use, uh, it, the fire touched all all parts of the land, right, right from the valley bottoms right to the very top of the alpine areas. And the alpine areas uh, uh, was hunting areas, uh, picking, uh, especially huckleberry and uh, the different berries that you find up there, raspberries and uh, strawberries, uh, and then the uh, spruce balsam that that grows there, the true fir, uh, subalpine fir. That that's a medicine. So th that whole area was also either either it burned naturally by lightning, or indigenous people would uh, set fire to it uh after use so if if they went and hunted and then are picked um and they they deemed it uh uh too thick um not producing um they would light uh, light it on fire as they left uh so that it'll be improved for the next the next year and uh all the ways down through the uh, lodgepole pine and uh, uh, then ponderosa pine down to the grassland. 
and so each each one has has its own um, species that uh, encroach upon each other and so if you look at uh, grassland on the bottom you have sage that encroaches on the grass and then uh, juniper and ponderosa pine and interior douglas fir and uh, which actually suppresses the grassland so if you want to have uh, like area for elk and bison and uh, white-tailed deer mule deer that kind of stuff you you would want to burn that every every two years to keep it uh, grassland or open meadow um, in the past there would be like uh, the grassland with uh, trees and maybe bunches of trees every now and then but not the way that it is right now uh, especially with overgrown with sage where no grass grows and uh, you know the deer they still eat it and stuff like that but uh, uh, if it was uh, managed properly it would be a grassland and and it would be a lot healthier and then you know along with mismanagement uh, comes uh, the uh, the wood ticks and the mice uh, uh, so the wood ticks uh, in the in indigenous spirituality uh, the uh, there's a, a balance between the darkness and the light and uh, with the with the darkness uh, being the uh, the evil and then the light being uh, the good so um, if a if a forest is uh, looked after and managed properly um, you know there's a lot more open spaces and, and uh, it's a lot easier for the animals to to move especially deer they don't have to worry about uh, cougars and predators so much because they can see a lot farther um it, it it's it's not if you look at the forest now there's a lot of cover for different predators to hide whether it's um owls or eagles wolves cougars lynx um the advantage is is on their side for rabbits and for squirrels and uh deer moose elk that kind of thing so um there's not there's a balance is not not right and um and also you know like i was talking about the wood ticks move in the mice and the a lot more spiders and um, defoliators things like that that are all uh negative they they um they did occur in the past before contact, um, but um, not as much as, as they do now. Definitely, uh, there's a, like a thousand fold increase in, uh, in these, uh, in, the, in the change of the forest. Uh, but now with the loss of water from, uh, uh, the trees taking taking up so much of the nutrients and water and now with climate change and how thick the forest is and now what we're seeing in these days and over the last five to ten years um, is a catastrophic fire um, I in my fire career um, 1994 uh, 1989 uh, were the the first indicators that uh, things were changing. Uh, another one was 1998 and 2003. And and every time you know the temperatures got hotter, uh, the uh, um, the mountains that had that were snow capped all year round uh, began to be patchy snow and the snow be began to disappear on top of mountains and uh, 2003 and then uh, 2009 um, 
it kind of started to go uh, where uh, in the past, the, the, the bad fire years were every four to seven years. And now it's um, almost yearly or it's uh, um, every every two to three years, uh, it's bad fire years. If you think of uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, you know, you can, you can keep on going right till present. Last summer, uh, it seemed we had a long springtime. Uh, but then all of a sudden, uh, summer hit and the high temperatures came and low humidity and uh, fires broke out. And um, so these last uh, five to 10 years, we've uh, had the catastrophic fires. And it's the first time I've heard of a million hectare fire. And um, 1994, when I was in Penticton, uh, that fire was about, if I remember right, around 10,000 hectares. But the uh, it was the first time that uh, uh, dwellings were lost, and uh, that you know those those signs are are still are still in our path, and so. Um, so one of the signs from last year is the the Hope fire, uh, Squamish, and uh, fires on Vancouver Island. So so generally those are uh, that's a rainforest and it's generally not available for fire. It doesn't get hot uh, hot and dry long enough to sustain uh, a forest fire. Uh, I could remember them talking in the past before contact that you know it was it was burned. They took their time in the springtime and they burned off the um, uh, black. Is it the black cherries? The the cherry bushes, anyways, and they have lots. They're really thorny and the different uh, brush that that chokes it out, and you can't hardly walk. They would, they would burn all that, but. Again, they're not allowed to burn either. And so what they have down there is a really thick forest with a really deep duff, um, at least three feet, six feet sometimes. And when when the, the drug codes get so high that all of that fuel is available and those trees are uh, 300 feet tall, um, you're going to have fires that are so dangerous. Um, and so right now, the uh, with climate change and the future that we're looking at, the uh, the 50 degree temperature, they called it a heat dome that hit in the Merritt area and hit across the southern part of BC. Uh, well, it lasted about six days. And so if... Uh, if the next heat dome comes and it lasts um, seven to 10 days, and then in years later, it lasts 10 to 15 days, um, you're looking at uh, catastrophic fire, but you're also looking at places that generally don't burn, will be available to burn. And, um, you know, a lot of the, the Kootenai area with the uh, cedar, and the wet, the wet area, and the um, coastal areas would make a really dangerous fire because uh, all of the fuel that that is there and available to burn. Um, so the the indigenous um, use of fire uh, over thousands of years. Um, could be a way to to get back to a more sa safer um, uh, time for for ourselves as humans. Um, you know, we live we live close to the forests, 
and uh, you know we've we've seen um, the entire town like Lytton uh, burned and um, with the with the indigenous burning um, grassland burns every two years like I was saying ponderosa pine interior Douglas fir uh, seven to fifteen years ponderosa pine I mean sorry uh, lodgepole pine um, I believe it's 20, 20 to 60 years. And uh, the higher up um, spruce, uh, ESSF it's called, uh, subalpine fir areas is uh, 100 to 200 years. Um, and then the uh, the change in that in that uh, lodgepole pine and uh, um, ESSF is if indigenous people wanted uh, huckleberry places, those huckleberry areas were maintained as a huckleberry patch, and they were burned every four years in the fall time. And uh, so, if you think about that, you have um, different mosaics structures in the forest where uh, right now, if you think of the, of how, of, as far as you can see is trees. In the past, it would have been different age groups, uh, some open areas for meadows and uh, uh, some open areas for berries and uh, different kinds of berries. Uh, so a fire just could not run the way that they do right now. And you, you, you wouldn't see um, hundreds of thousands of hectares burning uh, and you wouldn't get the intensity also. Uh, another thing that we're living through at this time is uh, uh, smoke. Uh, if, uh, if you're around, you know, around uh, pre 1990s, there was no smoke issues ever in the summertime. Every once in a while, you might see smoke in the far distance, and but it never was where you couldn't leave your house, uh, where you couldn't travel, um, you couldn't go you, where you couldn't go for a walk for 15, 20 minutes. Um, uh, though. And that was uh, in thanks to indigenous burning over thousands of years. And now that that time is gone, the hard work of the indigenous people over thousands of years uh, is disappearing because, uh, because of the laws. And um, the Wildfire Act uh, needs to change some, it needs to include um, indigenous fire keepers in in the laws can um, so we can light fires and use fire in the spring and fall in the winter to 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 bring back uh, natural fuel loading and natural fire cycles back to the land and uh, and enhance uh, the our medicine berries and uh, ungulate uh, foraging and uh, as well as our own human foraging ourselves and the spin-off effect of course from that is uh, is that we have uh, a lot safer uh, communities and uh, private land and all that kind of stuff would, would also be burned all around and and so the uh, I'm talking hopefully uh, if everything changes right and we're allowed to use fire again within five to uh, to twenty five years, that uh, we start to to go back to um, not having to worry about uh, fires again um, in the summertime and being able to leave the house um, and not worry about smoke and that kind of stuff. Um, I'll just check my notes again, see if I'm missing anything.
yeah okay so i think uh yeah that i touched on pretty much everything i wanted to talk about Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, I know that you have lots that you could talk about. And um, yeah, you were trying to limit what you could say. So, but thanks for fitting all that in. We have, of course, a number of questions for you, some really great questions. Um, so at this point in time, we're gonna open up a dialogue. Um, the plan, everybody, is uh, if you haven't been with us so far, is that you put your questions in the chat. And then we're going to read them aloud to Joe, and then he will respond. If for some reason I'm pronouncing something incorrectly, or um, you want to clarify your question, you are welcome to just unmute yourself um, and speak. Okay. So I'm just going to start with one with the first question from Ben, and um, he asks, "Would the grass burn cycle be the same for the prairie in Alberta, Saskatchewan, or Manitoba, for example?" Yes. Yeah, all all grassland, uh, all the grass uh, is the same. So, um, the they live for one year, and then during that during that winter time, uh, they go dormant, and then the next year, new the the uh, roots uh, stay alive, but the top uh, either gets eaten by animals or it or it dies and stays on the ground. And so if you burn every two years, uh, especially in the springtime for grassland, uh, where the, the roots stay wet from the winter, uh, moisture in the ground, and then the, you burn the top off. Um, and it also creates the, uh, the top of the earth will be black from the burning, uh, which uh, uh, sucks in the heat from the sun and the nutrients go into the ground and then you have a flush of uh, grasslands and medicine. Uh, so the answer is yes for that. Okay, thanks, Joe. All right, so next up we have a question from Alyssa and she says, I'm curious if cultural burning has ever gotten out of control and if so, how is that addressed? Um, so her, she has in brackets with the understanding that with more, I think that's supposed to say more frequent burns, there were probably less fuels. I know that one of the, I know that fear is one of the major concerns of current regulators and inhibits the willingness for burns for ecological restoration. Yes. So yeah, in the past, um, um, no, the, the fires did not get out of control. And like you were saying, you know, there was less fuel and over, and the, the land was, was manicured um, so that it could only burn so far. And uh, the... Uh, but the traditional people that talk about the stories of indigenous burning, um, that they would light fires in, in certain points and let it to, and just let it run and they could uh they could they could pray that the fire would stop in a certain area and it would go a certain distance and it would go out. And um not only from prayer but also just from um the the year the year before burning or, you know, uh, just less fuel, uh, rain, you know, diff it, you burn in the spring and you burn in the fall. You never, we've never burned in the summertime in the lower elevations. And that's another issue with um, um, saying you can't, you can't, the burn ban is on, on April the 15th or May the 1st or whatever, because uh, if you want to burn for medicines higher up in the Alpine, that actually doesn't dry out till the end of August and September. So uh, at different elevations, um, uh, there, there has to be a, a way to, to burn, to, to burn for certain, certain animals, certain medicines and certain berries and stuff. So, you know, e even just that one regulation of the, the burn ban is on at, at a certain set date may, April the 15th or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Thanks, Joe. Um, so question from Jim, he says, uh, this is referring to cultural burns. Who within the community was in charge of the burning and how did they decide when and how to burn? Right, so uh, prior to contact, uh, um, the matriarchs had a council and uh, they actually picked uh, who 
who would run for chief um, and then the whoever they picked to be uh, run for chief would compete with each other to but they were always it was always the matriarchs the the our society was female female driven and they also knew where the berries were where the where the medicines were and uh and then of course the hunters and and things like that also had had uh, control of where burns were 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 taken care of and of course the ladies do when to when to move from one place to another so mostly it was a matriarchal society great thanks joe um so now we have a question from Ivan and he says, how would indigenous burning on areas previously harvested for timber and now restocked with new, uh, yeah, and now restocked with the new forest? Yeah, the, so the fuel management uh, and fire management um, of the area and land management. So indigenous people would have input on, on, um, on how much fuel should be there and you know whether there should be meadows and and uh riparian areas for ducks and you know of course you can see where there used to be ponds that are dried up and things like that so obviously there's too many trees um so certain areas they really need to be managed and in some cases you know uh logging and uh, that kind of stuff would would have to take place to to bring the the overgrown areas back to back to a natural state and try to mimic uh, um, fire runs and things like you know instead of having square blocks have more oval cut blocks you know that that can be burned and if if they want they could uh, um, replant them again and. Um, but as far as the uh, that land management, uh, indigenous people uh, would want the input on 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 the land over the land. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Joe. So this next question from Corey, I think it kind of uh, is well. It's a it's it's well connected, um, and you might not have all the answers, but I'm sure you have thoughts here. So Corey asks. How can indigenous burning be managed in our current situation? The fuel loads are much greater, so the risk and the liabilities are greater too. Who assumes the risk to communities if the fire gets out of control? I agree it's a great idea, but I wonder how our legal system would deal with it. There's a lot of public concern over prescribed fire and its risks. Yeah, so cultural burning and prescribed fire is different. Uh, uh, prescribed fire is, uh, is you pick a date to burn, you uh, and there's all kinds of regulations on prescribed burning, and so cultural burning is is being connected to the land, um, uh, knowing when the best time to burn, and uh, you know whether it's early spring as soon as the snow leaves and uh, you get a few days of warm sun and the grass is ready to burn, then uh, um, uh, you can light it. Uh, so if the wind is blowing from the southwest, you'd light it in the north, northeast area so that it burns into the snow or burns into a roadway. And then you, you layer it back towards the southwest so that you control how hot it is. Um, and if there's trees involved in that, by layering it back, you control the heat and so you don't kill the, the tops of the trees. Uh, there's There's a lot of different ways of burning it and uh uh like you're saying nowadays the, the the care has to be taken definitely on bringing it back to natural and like i'm saying also um some logging some thinning some uh spacing and pruning uh might need to be done before the burn and if you do that then you can burn during the you can burn those piles during the winter time so that um, you slowly you slowly bring it back to how it should be and and if it's a 
a grassland that was that's encroached by trees you know eventually you're going to want to have patches of trees or like a, a tree every one or 200 meters or something like that just for shade um, but mostly grassland and so you think about a an area like around uh, Kasakar, uh where the uh, the trees are right up against the buildings and stuff like that. So you slowly want to move those back and create more more of a grassland and more of a mosaic on the in the valley. Um, and it's it's not a fast process; it's a slow process, like I'm saying, um, over a five. 25 year period and your your mind your land management mind has to think um over hundreds of years um like you hear native people saying uh for for my grandchildren and their grandchildren so you think you think more of a longer term process interesting joe um Gosh, I have questions that I want to ask of my own, but I'll move on. Um, there are two questions here that are related. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them both, okay? And then you can respond to them together. So the first one comes from Eva. Um, are there discussions happening between the nations and the province to amend the Wildfire Act to allow for cultural burning? And then the next question is from John. And he says, Joe, you spoke about the legal and political barriers to reintroducing Indigenous fire. What needs to change? How can we, uh, sorry, how do we get more alignment between BC Wildfire Service prescribed burning and Indigenous cultural burning? Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So right now, the wildfire branch is uh, attempting to, to uh, include cultural burning, but uh, I think the process isn't, isn't very well. They want to, they want to, uh, Make it more of a prescribed burn type thing, which doesn't doesn't work. It's too slow and onerous, um, and it and it doesn't go far enough. And uh, I'll I'll be speaking again in uh, uh, in Vernon on Earth Day. Uh, the the Green Party invited me to to speak about uh, cultural burning. And hopefully, uh, the uh, that that we could begin a change in uh, in laws, and especially the Wildfire Act. There's one part uh, 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 part of my job when I worked with forestry with uh, the wildfire branch uh, was fire prevention, and uh, the Wildfire Act, and and one of them I can't I don't remember everything about it, but it said. Uh, a fire a forest officer could enter any land to mitigate fuel uh or you know the the forest service can can write a prescription to a landowner and tell them to uh to to take care of the fuel or else a crew will come in and then they'll they'll get charged for it and so if they change that from a forest officer and or uh, indigenous firekeeper can enter any land to mitigate fuel right there you know that's like a a huge change already and so that's all in the forest act the wildfire act and uh so if you include indigenous people indigenous firekeepers in those uh in that language then, then things will will start to change okay interesting thanks joe um, are there any other questions before we conclude? If you feel welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question or type it into the chat. I think that might be it. How big how big was a typical burn? Question from Corey. Uh, before contact, uh, a typical burn probably would be uh, anywhere is but around ten hectares to up to uh, probably about two thousand five hundred. Like a, um, I know the Krugers in Penticton they tell a story about uh, 
uh, two to three mountains burning. Uh, so, so like if you look at a mountainside, that whole mountain would be burning, and then and then another one and another one, and that would be done one year. But then over a seven year cycle, uh, the next the next mountains would burn, and then the next one. So everything would be done in cycles, depending on the elevation and the the uh, aspect of uh, of the mountain. So yeah, that's a good question. Great. Okay, everyone. Um, I think you're starting to get some thank yous. And um, oh, great. So Kaya, actually, on this topic of the Wildfire Act, there's a link in the chat that some people might find helpful. Um, so thanks coming into the chat for you, Joe, if you wanted to have a look. I'm going to get formal for a moment and uh, share my screen and do some formal wrap ups and some thank yous. So of course, Joe, thanks very much for your time, uh, sharing your wisdom with us, and um, yeah, and and being thought provoking as you always are. Um, we would like to say thank you to all of you for your time and your attendance, um, and uh, to our sponsors, of course. So we have the Columbia Basin Trust, as I said earlier, who's um, given us some funding for this series. Um, to KCP for their partnership and for KCP's core funding that allow them to do their important work in the region. Um, and a teaser for next week. So in this series, we're going to continue to sort of delve into sort of hands-on, on-the-ground stewardship activities that are linking to some of those bigger ideas that were presented earlier in the series. So next week, we'll be hearing from Eric Leslie. Um, and he'll be presenting a talk, uh, Climate Adaptation and Action for the Herrick Proctor Community Forest. So that same day, same time next week, March 9th. Um, if you haven't already registered, go ahead and do so. Um, of course, the recordings have been posted to the event webpage, and there's a, there's a really fantastic list of recordings there already from this season and, and seasons in the past. So you can find those at cmiae.org and of course at KCP's website as well. So thanks again, everybody. Um, really great to share our lunch hours together. Thanks, Joe, for your time. Um, and yeah, that's it from me. Bye, everybody. <laughs>